I'm a GMAT Club's uh, resident verbal expert. So this is series three, video number eight. And this is the fourth and final installment in the Word Problem Bootcamp. And real quick, uh, we've got a live crowd here. All of these are live, so no second takes, no edits. You want to see a supposedly smart guy do really stupid human things, you're in the right place. Had lots of muting problems, lots of tech problems. Might happen again today. Bear with us. Hey, this is just like a tutoring session, all live. Um, so we've got some people here watching live as always. And thank you so much, everybody. There's wonderful, wonderful comments before I even started the broadcast. And thank you so much, guys. That's uh, absolutely something that's fun for me to read this morning. OK, so what are we doing today? When you look on your enhanced score report, there's this mysterious category called counting sets and series. And let me go and share my screen real quick here. And I'll show you an example of this. And this is a relatively recent thing that's happened. So the uh, enhanced score reports just got even more enhanced recently. And so now you have this performance by fundamental skills section that shows up. And so you get the questions on the quant broken down in even more categories. Now, a couple thoughts on this. One is that you're when you look at that enhanced score report from the GMAT, you have 28 questions that are actually scored that are part of your test. And uh, they broke this down into five sections. So you're looking at only, on average, five or six questions per category. And I am getting tons of questions about this. So people look at their ESRs and they say, oh my goodness, the counting set series, I only got 66% right. What's going on here? Well, first of all, that's only three questions, maybe six questions. So it's not a huge part of your test. I'm not sure that you want to overreact to any of these categories. But this is one in particular where people have come to us and said, hey, I, I seem to be bad at counting set series. What do I do with this? So basically what today's video is about is trying to address that question when we say counting set series, what exactly is that? And in particular, I'm going to pick on some of the wordier versions of it. Now, what I am not going to be able to do, so when I came up with this topic, uh, I knew this was going to be a little bit broad for a one-hour session, and there's also something else on the GMAT Club YouTube channel at the top of the hour. So I'm going to try to keep this under 50 or 55 minutes, and it is a massive, massive topic. There's so much kind of so many little things that are kind of scattered around as part of this. So this is not going to be super comprehensive. My goal is just to give you a sense of the ways you need to think to conquer these questions, give you a sense of what things you need to study, what things you need to think about in terms of how you get your mind right to take the GMAT. And just as importantly, what's not really a big deal? So people freak out about probability, combinations, permutations, which I think fall into this category. Uh, so I'm going to talk about those a little bit as well. One last thought. The other reason that I bring this, this particular topic up, the advanced GMAT quant book that or advanced GMAT book that just came out, 300 questions, uh, maybe a third of them never been seen anywhere else before, supposedly 300 of the toughest retired questions. There's also a category in there, counting sets and series. Now, for what it's worth, uh, it turns out that those categories were not created for that book by the people at GMAC, which is really, really interesting. The publisher actually hired an outside contractor uh, to do that. So it was just some kind of random person who supposedly knew about the GMAT who decided to go through a set of 1,500 questions and figure out which one are counting sets series. So as I look through those questions, I'm not sure that definition is exactly right. Those designations in that advanced GMAT book pretty shaky, so don't take those too seriously. And again, what I'm going to focus on today is kind of a broad overview of the topics that fall into that category and give you some tools for dealing with them. All right. As always, I have examples. I've got about 12 questions I'm going to try to get through. And like I said, I'm going to try to hustle today just because there's something else at the top of the hour. Um, so it's a pretty basic one. This is what a lot of people think of when they see a sets question, kind of a standard overlapping sets setup. Give you guys a minute or two to work on this. And again, if you're part of the live group, please, please let us know what your answer is. If you're stumped on it, fantastic. Let us know that as well. Super helpful.
All right, looks like the live group's being pretty shy. Once you get an answer, please let us know. Helps me a ton. Helps me know if you're struggling. Again, I'm used to kind of working one-on-one -on -one with people. Used to hearing voices. Ooh, we've got some variety. This is great. I thought I was just warming you guys up. And once again, if you're not watching this live, or even if you are, you might want to take a screenshot because as soon as I come back to the board, the question will disappear on you. Got a mix of A's, B's, and D's. Interesting. Okay, not what I expected. Cool, harder than I expected. So this was kind of meant to be a little bit of a warm-up question because I think that most of most of the test prep companies out there, I think, are doing a really, really nice job on these. Um, so tons of good pedagogy around this kind of stuff. Most companies will teach us something like this little double set matrix. Um, you could do this with actual Venn diagrams. I think this is a little bit more straightforward, easier to keep your information organized. So basically the idea here is that uh, there's two kinds of people. There's ones that pass the written test, those who fail the written test. We've got people who pa pass the drinking test, fail the drinking test. Great. So in this case, we know that 60% pass the written test. So we can write that in here. We know there's 100% total. That means that 40% must have failed the written test. Cool. 75% pass the drinking test. By the way, even if you're not a wine drinker, so sommeliers, if you ever meet a really good sommelier, bring them a bottle of good wine covered in foil and say, identify this wine. I have a good friend in New York City. Amazing. You can bring him a foil wrapped bottle of wine. He can taste it and, and name the year and the region it was produced in. Incredible. Anyway, sommelier testing, no joke. So our question is, we want to know what percentage passed, I'm sorry, what percentage passed both of the tests? So this is the one that we're looking for. So great. What do we know from statement one that 20% passed the written test only? Okay, so what I'm gonna do here, just with statement one to make my life a little bit easier on the data sufficiency versions of these, 20% passed the written only. So that means that those are people that passed the written, failed the drinking test. So we can put a 20% there, we're gonna toss it in a little corner. That means that this is 5%. That means that this is 40%. And fantastic, I got exactly what I want. We can cross out B, C, E, answer must be A or D. And then I'm gonna cross this out. Why, and I don't wanna dwell on this for too long because I got about 12 questions I wanna get through today. But on data sufficiency versions of these two-way overlapping sets questions, I don't wanna draw this matrix three times. I don't wanna draw three sets of Venn diagrams. This little, little trick with statement one, if I stick it in a little corner, I leave everything that's given in the question written in large print. Anything from statement one alone, I'm gonna to toss in a little corner. And that way I don't have to redraw it. Now I can just go on with statement two, 15% passed neither. So that goes here. Well, if 15% passed neither and 40% failed the written, that must mean that 25% go here and 50% here. And unless I goofed up the numbers, which I just realized, no, that's good. 50% uh, answers D. That was your warm-up. Welcome to GMAT Word Problem Bootcamp. Second question gets tougher, gets kookier. They start messing with the language. Here you go, have another.
And once again, if you're in the live group, please don't be shy. If you're stumped, let us know. Answers are coming in slowly, which makes me think this is a tougher question than I expected. Cool, getting some Bs, getting some Es. Please don't be shy, guys. <laughs> Thank you, gang. I accidentally muted myself. This is the third session where I've done this. I joked at the beginning, come watch this supposedly smart human do very human silly things. So uh, apologies for that once again. This is what happens. I don't have any producer with their, uh, their voice in my ear or anything. So all right, let me start this over again. The lecture I was giving, for those of you who are not expert re lip readers, what I was saying is a lot of these harder overlapping sets questions, the basics of overlapping sets, pretty simple for most people. The harder part is making sure you really pay attention to the words of, only, sounds really, really silly, but that's where most of these mistakes come from. So what do we know? 75% of the total are conservative. I can punch that in here. I know that 60% of the conservatives voted for A, so three-fifths of that 75% gives you 45% that are both conservative and voted for A. You know, 100% is the total total. Do a little subtraction. Um, and we end up with 5% here. So these, the question is, what percent of non-conservative supported A? Here's the mistake I see over and over and over. I'm not sure that a lot of people did it in the live session. Most of the comments I'm seeing are just, hey, Charles, turn your mic back on. So the temptation is to say the answer is A, 5%. Read the question carefully. What percentage of the non-conservatives so out of these guys, out of this 25%, out of that 25%, what percent of those guys voted for A? So that's five out of the 25. And that gives you a fifth. That gives you 20%. So answers B. All right. Let's see if I can make a mistake with the mute button on this next one too. And actually, we're going to move on to a different topic related, still in this realm of counting sets series. And again, out of these three questions or six questions or however many we're seeing, tons and tons of variety. This is something else. I call these counting questions. Some people call them fence post questions. Here's a really, really basic version. And then I'll make it kookier in just a moment. Go ahead and take a moment.
If you're in the live group and you're struggling, please let us know. Just kidding. I was muted on purpose that time. Um, all right. Some of all evens between 99 and 301. So really, really straightforward. If you've seen these questions before, if you haven't, I apologize. I'm going to rip through this pretty quickly because my point is mostly about the kookier version of this question that comes next. So some of all evens between 99 and 301. So you can think of it this way. What's the 99 and the 301 doing? Really nothing. Those aren't even numbers. We could treat this as exactly the same as asking for all the evens between 100 and 300 inclusive. So one mistake I see people make quite a bit, and I don't think I put this in the trap answers necessarily, but 100 to 300, you could say, oh, well, that's 200 integers total. 300 minus 100, 200 integers, right? And then you could say, well, 100 of them are even, except you got to be really careful. These are called fence post problems by some people. If you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, Google better explained fence post problem. Awesome article about how to think about that. This is 201 integers. Since we're starting and ending this version of it on evens, there's 101 evens. Easiest way to do these. Plenty of formulas out there, plenty of different gimmicks for doing this, probably four or five different ways you could do this. I'm only going to model one of them, which is the idea that, well, you know that a sum has to be an average times n. So the number of terms. In this case, we know we have 101 even terms. What's the average of these? Well, it's got to be smack in the middle evenly spaced set. Your mean has to be equal to the median. So we end up with an average of 200. Multiply these two guys together, we get 20,000 plus another 200. And that's it. All right, let's make these tougher. Let's make it look more like a good, legit GMAT word problem. So I think we're coming pretty close to the two minute mark here. If you're in the live group and you're stumped, please just say that in the live chat, please. Okay, this is fantastic. Lots of struggles. The the few people that have um, gotten this so far are doing well, but I'm just not seeing a whole lot coming across from the live group, which tells me that you're really struggling to kind of get through the language. Uh, if you've watched the rest of the series on uh, our little word problem bootcamp that we've done for four Tuesdays in a row now, this is the final one. Our previous one, video number three, was about kind of these long wordy problems that I don't want you to be intimidated by. A lot of what the GMAT's up to, I'm not sure it's very deliberate, 
but they'll tell you what you want in that question. And they might make it look like a Russian novel you've got to read forever. But generally speaking, the underlying math isn't that bad when you see this, this mountain of words. Great case of it here. What are we really asking? This is almost identical to the question we just did. It's really, really similar. Numbers are a little bit more cumbersome, a lot more words, but what's going on? Well, we've got the first row. We've got 17 rows of parking spaces, 20 in the first row, then it's 21, 23. And this is just your somebody, the term somebody in the audience like to use, arithmetic progression. It's your nice evenly spaced set. So all we really need to do, we can use the same techniques we just did and say, well, I'm gonna leave this, this 20 out for a second. This is a whole bunch of odds. What am I looking for? I want the sum of all the odds from 21 until we get to that 17th row. So second row to 17th row, we went up by 15 rows. We go up by two every time, so we went up by 30. So the 17th row is gonna be 51. Great, all we need is the sum of odds from 21 to 51, inclusive. Do exactly the same thing we just did. What's that sum? It's going to be the average times n. What's the average here? That's going to be 72 divided by 2. Again, you're just taking the median, evenly spaced set. Mean equals the median equals the average of the first and last. And the number of terms. Well, we know that it's 16 terms here. If you don't believe me, you can go ahead and calculate it again. That's 16. We can cross out here. We get 8. So 56, 560 plus another 16, we get 576. That's for rows 2 through 17 out on the 20, and we got it. So typical GMAT, when you get into the word problem versions of these counting set series, just like anything else, they take really, really, really simple basic concepts, disguise it on you. Don't get intimidated. So I'm starting to get the question a little bit from the live audience, like, hey, what exactly is included in this? And I think this is a good moment in the video to, to take a step back and go, all right, um, what is everything that might be included here? So we went through the overlapping sets. So those nice, I did the double set matrix. Some people use Venn diagrams, overlapping sets. This one, we've got kind of this counting type problem. Probability, combinations, permutations, I think are included in this category as best I can tell. We're gonna talk about sequences as well. And more importantly, kind of sets in general, what's going on, what's the GMAT after? A lot of it is about pattern recognition. And that's gonna be the punchline toward the end of the video. I'm gonna give you a bunch of questions that fall into this category of counting set series. And the point really is gonna be that a lot of this is about your mindset. It's not about memorizing a whole bunch of ways to do specific problems. Sure, it helps to kind of be able to think this way, but I didn't do anything that's that fancy at all. This is really just the definition of an average. What's an average? Well, it's the sum divided by the number of terms. We rearrange that a tiny, tiny bit. There you go. Quick, elegant, easy answer. Very, very typical of the GMAT. Notice the section's not called mathematics. It's called quantitative reasoning. It's meant to be grade nine, grade 10 math, just packaged in funny ways. So if I had to say, what is counting set series? How can we break that down? It can include all kinds of things, but I'd say the bulk of them, overlapping sets is one label the test prep community tends to use, myself included. These questions that I, I tend to refer to as counting questions or fence post questions, probability, combinations, permutations. Um, and I've got a bunch of wisecracks about those coming up in just a moment. And then a lot of these sequences and pattern recognition questions. So all of that gets jumbled together. Some questions aren't really neatly separable into those separate categories, but that's kind of the bulk of what you see. And I'd argue that the big skills you need more than anything, it's not massive amounts of practice on this specific thing or that specific thing. It's really thinking about what are the patterns here and can I look at this crazy language and really take what's given to me, take exactly what's on the page, not get intimidated by it, and see if I can work through that in a nice methodical way. Read the question twice, take a breath, see if you can get to the heart of it. Again, this particular question pretty much ate the live group alive, and certainly in terms of time, got about 10 people that finished it, and another however many dozens that couldn't get anywhere on it. It's almost exactly the same as the previous question, just different numbers. You just got to take that breath, read twice, and cut to the heart of it. Classic GMAT. All right. I'm going to talk over this next one a little bit. So probability. So probability is one of the most anxiety-inducing question types on the GMAT. So back when uh, when I first started tutoring, and I've been doing this for embarrassingly almost 20 years now, um, one of the things people would tell me is that people would call me back in the day when I didn't necessarily get emails right away. You know, I listed my phone number, people would call me and, and I'd say, hey, you know, what do you think is holding you back? Hey, I just took my test yesterday, I did horribly. And I'd ask, what do you think the problem is? 
And almost invariably, people say probability. People say combinations, permutations. So here's kind of what people picture when they think probability question. Here's kind of a fundamental, fairly basic version of it. I'll give you guys a minute or two to take a shot at it. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how important or not important this type of question is. So go ahead and take a minute or two. Live crowd, please don't be shy. Tell me as soon as you have an answer. And I'll give you guys a hint. This should require almost no math. Oh, live group, come on, don't be shy. You're making me sad. We got about a seventh of you answering. Don't be shy. Helps me. See who's struggling, see who's not. I will not report any of your names to business schools. Got some C's, got some D's, got some A's. Thank you. If you disagree with the crowd, fantastic. Makes me happy. All right. And again, a lot of what I'm after. I'm not going to be comprehensive. I can't possibly teach you every single little variation of counting sets and series questions in an hour or under an hour that we're going to have today. My point is, let's get your mind right. Let's get you thinking like the GMAT. What are the skills here? Take your time. Read twice. See if you can find an easier way to get at it. If you start barreling through right away, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Or at the very, very least, you're going to cause, cause yourself just more, more steps than you need. More steps, more opportunities to make errors. Not awesome. Classic war and peace length question. What's the probability that a randomly selected person is younger than 40 or supports a funding source that includes attacks or both of those things? Just writing out that probability is a Russian novel. All right, fine. Well, what are we talking about? But the probability that somebody's either young, so under 40, so that's all of these guys, or they support a funding source with attacks, which could be this one or this one or both, fine, we're not gonna double count those. Here's the easiest way, what do you wanna do here? I could add all these up, no big deal, not that hard. Or I could say, what is not included in this probability? That 100 people, that's it. So everybody else is included in this. Well, I know there's 250 residents, they did the math for me. Wasn't that nice of them, the GMAT loves us. They did all the math for me. I know that my denominator is going to be 250. How many people? We got the 100 people who are not included in this group. That means 150 are included. That's it, folks. Three fifths. Answers D. We're out of here. And that classic GMAT. There's probably half a dozen, maybe a dozen different ways you could approach this question. Small differences. But if you really take your time, breathe a little bit. They're not doing anything terribly complicated here. You can avoid almost all of the arithmetic. Not that the arithmetic's hard but that saves you time, saves you opportunities to make errors, gets you that elegant solution really, really quickly. 
Okay. Now for the real punchline about probability. This is the kind of thing that keeps people up at night a little bit. Not that this is a very hard version of it. People say to me all the time, oh, probability, probability. I'm terrible at it. I'm terrible at it. So I actually went through today. I went through the advanced GMAT book and I went through the quant guide and I counted the number of questions that are probability. Uh, so in the advanced uh, GMAT book, there's, I think, two probability questions. And in the quant guide, the whole thing, the 2020 edition, 300 quant questions, there's three. So out of those two books, grand total, you've got five probability questions. That's it. Out of 450 quant questions, only five involve probability in any real way. So think about that. That's one question out of 90. Now, granted, that's one sample. Maybe they're a little bit more than the official guide or the GMAT prep or whatever. But you're looking at a question type that is not that big of a deal. If you're fighting for every last inch on the test, if you need every quarter point, every point, you bet, don't leave it on the table. Don't miss easy probability. But one of the things we say to our students all the time, you want to put your study time where you get the best bang for your buck. Probability, frankly, really isn't it because there's just not that much of it. Again, master everything you can. If you've got tons of time to study, go for it. Learn everything as well as you can, but keep it in perspective. Go through your, pra your official practice test. Go through the official guide. How much probability is there? The questions are memorable. They stick in our heads, but it's not that big of a deal. Okay. In the interest of time, I've got one more probability question here. I might skip it. Actually, I take that back. I think this is a good one for you guys. Let's go ahead and race through this, and then I'm, I'll maybe pick up speed a little bit. Awesome, now you guys are smoking it, makes me happy. So you can see what we did here. So this is just a combination of those previous two concepts. So, so far we have three concepts we've gone over, broadly speaking, overlapping sets, Venn diagrams, some people like to call them, kind of the counting fence post kind of questions. Now we got probability. And a big part of what I want you to think about as you're deciding how to allocate your time, is probability really the thing that's worth making a huge part of your study time when it's not that huge of a part of the GMAT? Okay, I just combined these last two things, the counting fence post kind of question, the probability. What's probability? Number of desired outcomes over number of total outcomes. So we want to know how many have a hundred digit of three. So that's going from 1300 to 1350. Well, that's 51 numbers. And what about from 1000 to 1350? That's 351. And there you go. That's all it is. Answer Z. All right, fantastic. A little bit of combinatorics. So we're only halfway through my questions. I'm going to try to wrap this up within 20 minutes here. So actually, we're not going to go all the way through this question in the interest of time. Um, I'll leave this up on the screen. And I just want to make the broader point. Here's another thing people freak out about. So when people hear, uh, you know, sets, counting, sets, series, combinatorics, people obsessively study this stuff, the combinatorics. Again, this is another thing. Every day back when I used to take phone calls directly and say, okay, what do you think is holding you back? People say, oh, the combinations, permutations, this is so hard. And I would go, yeah, 
Yeah, and it's maybe 3% of your test, certainly less than 5%, might be closer to 1% if you actually count through the official guides, how many of these questions are there? Again, if you're gonna study like crazy, if you're really going for that 760, 770 kind of score, you need a 50 quant, 51 quant, absolutely don't leave any stone unturned. But this just isn't that common. Here's a basic version of it. If you want, go ahead and take a screenshot, take a shot at it. Um, not too tough of a question. I'm gonna move on to the next one. Now this, I would argue, is exactly the same kind of concept. And now we get into this wonderful world that we talked about in Word Problem Bootcamp Part 3. We just took a basic concept, made it look all weird. I swear it's not that bad. Give you guys a couple minutes in the live crowd. And I already see people spitting out answers. Uh, that might be to the previous one. So we're going to take a look at this one. Number eight, we've got the wilderness area. So live group, please take a look at this one and let me know as soon as you have an answer. By the way, one thing I'm loving out of you guys, like I'm seeing people pop up with questions and you're answering them for each other. That's the spirit of GMAT Club. It's fantastic. Love it. Keep helping each other out. And if you're stumped or stuck in the live group, please let us know. Okay, now you guys are flying through. Great. So again, I'm not gonna go too crazy on this, but this is just a variation. The previous question that I flashed on the board quickly, number seven, that was a version that's combinations. Again, you guys can, there's plenty of great sources to go learn that. Come on over to GMAT Club, Buñuel, not sure the guy's human, he's amazing, written all kinds of guides to this stuff. And this is this is the same idea. This is permutations instead of, instead of combinations. But all it is is just recognizing that at each of these kind of intersection points, well, how many choices do you have of which path to take? You got three. How many here? You got three. How many at the beginning? You got two. How many here? You got three. Uh, that's it. Multiply those numbers together and you're done. And that's all the question is. We've taken something that's really, really simple, which might be something like, oh, you know, these questions where you get a code. Oh, how many five-letter codes can you make with the letters A through E? That kind of thing. Same exact idea here. Two choices here, three, three, three. Multiply them together. Peace out. You're done. So again, moral of the story, combinatorics, not that big of a deal. If you've got limited time to study, hey, right now it's October. It's admission season. So if you're applying in January, round two to American schools, for example, Maybe this isn't where you want to fall on your sword. You just want to get your mind right and say, hey, if I get something that's wordy, crazy, kooky, I'm going to take a moment, take a deep breath, see if I can cut to the heart of it. After I read it a couple times, don't get intimidated. If you don't see the connection, move on. And again, less than 3% probably of your questions or combinations, permutations. It's something we're studying for a lot of people. I wouldn't make that big of a deal of it if you're just trying to get a few points here and there or if this isn't your biggest problem. Okay, so, so far, counting set series, we've got overlapping sets, we've got these counting fence post kind of questions, we've got probability, we've got combinations, permutations. Last thing I want to talk about, let's get into the world of sequences and pattern recognition in general. Did I skip one? There we go. It's again, wordy, irritating, don't get intimidated.
And for the live group, as soon as you either have an answer or you want to gouge your eye out, please let us know if you're stuck, unhappy, cursing. You can curse in whatever language you like. And Abhijit, I'm going to finish up by uh, five minutes before the hour just so you can get the rest of the group prepped. Okay, great. Seeing some slowness in the live group, but people are getting it. Makes me happy. Takes a minute. So one thing that I think is worth studying, not a ton, don't obsess over it. You should recognize the sequence notation. I'm not going to break it down in detail right now. Again, tons of great content on GMAT Club. If you're not comfortable with sequence notation, Google it, GMAT Club, sequence notation. Get in there. If you have questions, people answer them. Other test takers know what you're going through. Bunuel has already answered everything, everything in the world, meaning of life. Bunuel's on it. All right, so what is this saying? This is just a fancy, goofy way of saying any term in the sequence. What is it? Well, we have the first term is one, second term is one. What's the third term? Third term is the sum of the previous term plus double two terms before it. So what's the third term? Well, it's one plus twice this thing. So it's three. What's the fourth term? Well, it's the previous term plus twice that thing. It's five and so on. That's it. Fifth term, five plus double the previous term. So that's six plus five, that's 11. Somebody yell at me, please, if you make a math mistake. Just kidding, I can't hear you guys, but uh, you can send me messages that I'll see later. Sixth term, previous term plus double this term. 21, what's the seventh term? Previous term plus twice the previous before that. 22 plus 21, 43. Answers B, very, very typical GMAT. Again, it's about not getting intimidated, take a breath, digest the question. The other thing, Again, one of the things I say all the time, some of you guys that have watched a lot of my videos probably really sick of hearing it. It's not the math section. It's the quantitative reasoning section. It's not about calculus. I would bet anything that at least half of the people who are watching this are better at calculus than I am. I've forgotten it all. Not useful on the GMAT. Advanced math, not useful really on the GMAT. It's grade nine, grade 10, maybe grade seven or eight if you were a really smart kid. I was not. I got in a lot of trouble. Uh, so basic math for most people. What are they testing you on? Can you recognize patterns? Can you read and not get intimidated? This business of pattern recognition, I get asked all the time, sequences, what are they really about? Once you know the basic notation and can interpret it, it's about establish the pattern and keep going. Th that is the heart, especially as you get up to the tougher questions. That's really the heart of this counting set series as far as I can tell. Pattern recognition, number properties is a lot about pattern recognition. As you get to the big boy, big girl questions, that's what the GMAT's really chasing. Let's do one more. I've got two more. I've got about five minutes. So I might go a little bit quickly. Again, apologies for the schedule log jam today. Actually, I'm going to skip this one. Yeah, let's do this guy. This one's a classic. And live group, as soon as you either have an answer or as soon as you have no idea, if your eyes start bleeding on this right away, please let us know. Nice. Seeing some E, seeing some D, seeing some C. 
And again, if you're if you need a little more time on this, feel free to hit the pause button. Rewind if you're not watching this live. Sorry, live group. I know I'm moving a little fast today, but uh, there's another great, great session coming up at the top of the hour. So stay on this channel. Stay on the GMAC Club YouTube channel if you're watching us live because uh, there's some great stuff coming up. So I just have a few more minutes. I think this looks really intimidating. Um, I don't love the question because it assumes that you know there's 365 days in a year. I think everybody knows that, but it'd be kind of nice of them to tell you. What's going on here? This is a pattern, right? Days of the week, repeat just like a sequence repeats, right? Or units, digits, if you've done those questions, repeat. That's the most intelligent thing I'm gonna say all day. Okay, we got five years here. So in that five years, how many days do we have? Well, it's five times the 365. So that's what, 18, 25, stop me if I have that math wrong. But you have a leap year in there, correct? So with that in mind, you get one more. So we have 1,826 days. And the question is how many, the question isn't how many weeks do we cycle through? It's after we're done cycling through complete weeks, where do we land? So we can take that 1826 and say, well, 1826, if I divide that by seven, what do I get? Well, I really don't care what I get here, but for whatever it's worth, I think we get 260, something like that. And we've got a remainder of six. So what does that mean? In those five years, 260 weeks go by. And then you go six more days. We started on Friday. So we go through 260 weeks. At the end of those 260 weeks, we're back on Friday. And then you go six more. That lands you on Thursday. Thursday is your answer. That's all it is. Again, very, very typical GMAT. Everything has, I don't want to say everything does. Most things, as you get to these hard questions, there's something there that once you can recognize some sort of pattern, something repeating, cleans up really, really quickly. All right, I've got two minutes left. I'm going to give you one more. Here's what I'd encourage you to do. Um, so live crowd, if you get an answer right away, outstanding. I'm going to flash this on the screen pretty quickly just to make room for the next session. Might want to take a screenshot. You can suffer through this at home. If you're watching this not live, you might want to pause because I'm going to give you about a minute. And then I'm going to blast through a solution to it and then we'll wrap up. <laughs> all right i love it the live group is uh, i think all i've got so far is a smiley face i'm not sure if it's in reference to this question um and it may well be a snarky smiley face that just goes uh this is brutal so i'm going to tease this and i'm going to drop the mic on it um and we'll let you guys figure out the final answer on your own typical gmat you know since there's a hundred different terms here you know, there's got to be something in the pattern. It has to be the case. You can't just add up 100 numbers, especially when the numbers are a little bit complicated. So if n is 1, what do we have here? 1 over 1 minus 1 over 2. Oh, that's a half. I could start doing a bunch of arithmetic, but let me see how this unfolds. 1 over 2 minus 1 over 3. 1 over 3 minus 1 over 4. And that's going to keep going on and on forever. Notice what happens. Minus half plus a half. Minus a third plus a third minus a fourth plus a fourth and so on. Everything is gonna cancel except your first term and your last term. I'm sorry, that's 101 right there, my bad. And that's all it is. Okay, I have to wrap the mic pretty quickly here. So again, we're in series three. This is video number eight. We got one more left this Friday. I'm gonna be talking about uh, sentence correction, countable, non-countable on GMAT sentence correction. It's gonna be 8.30 a.m. Pacific. Friday, I believe that's the 20, 25th, maybe. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to the live group. 
Uh, if you're watching this live, stay on this channel. Great admissions video coming up in about three minutes. And I'm going to drop the mic. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, especially the live group. Thank you so much for all the feedback and all the kind words, uh, especially the folks that were here at the beginning. Have fun studying, everybody. We'll see you Friday. One last sentence correction session, 8.30 a.m. Pacific, 9 o'clock p.m. Indian time. Thank you so much.